I've been asked to set the scene by looking at the uh, burden of uh, thromboembolism amongst cancer patients and the impact it has uh, on uh, clinical outcome in this important population. These are uh, my um, uh, disclosures. I'll just leave them up for a moment. Uh, the companies that I've worked with uh, and continue to do so in, in my research in thrombosis and anticoagulation. Now, what I plan to do today is to try and uh, look at the question of the incidence of thromboembolic disease uh, in the surgical uh, oncology population, the medical oncology population, look at some of the problems with regard to uh, recurrent thromboembolism in uh, patients uh, with cancer who have had their first episode, a and also, I think, a very important feature, the devastating impact uh, that bleeding can have uh, in these fully anticoagulated patients and the impact that has uh, on their clinical outcome. And then explore some of the evidence with regard to the interesting question that has yet uh, fully uh, been explored of the impact that the establishment of venous thromboembolism has on overall clinical outcome and mortality in patients with malignant disease. Now, what I think is of interest is to try and understand that uh, clearly with regard to the natural history of the cancer disease, venous thromboembolism uh, affects uh, clinical outcome uh, at different stages in that natural history. So uh, as we can see, and I think I have a pointer here, um, what will happen over time is that at the time of diagnosis and presentation, uh, frequently we will see that uh, patients with underlying malignant disease uh, may present with a spontaneous thromboembolic episode. And an area of considerable controversy is what one should do to those so-called uh, idiopathic VTE patients uh, with regard to screening for underlying malignant disease. And the, the jury, I think, is still very much out on that. Large studies uh, have suggested that there isn't merit, not, there is no merit in screening for malignant disease in patients who present uh, with a spontaneous venous thromboembolism for which no other cause can be found because the ability to impact on the natural history of the cancer if detected early uh, as a result of pursuing a cancer diagnosis in a VTE patient uh, has, has not been well established. But clearly, uh, the studies do show that if you look at a population, a cohort of patients who present with a spontaneous thrombosis for underlying cancer, you will find a number of cancers at an earlier stage, potentially, than if you allowed those cancers to go on and present clinically. So it is an interesting question, and the type of screening modality and the organ uh, sites of particular interest uh, remain, as I say, controversial. But then as one moves through uh, the management of a patient with malignant disease, hospitalization uh, represents a particularly high-risk period for the cancer patient, as I will show you, whether they are admitted uh, principally um, to, um, for surgical management of their disease or whether indeed uh, they are hospitalized as medical oncology patients. Uh, we then uh, hopefully have some success in managing their disease. Uh, they may go into remission and then they may present with recurrent uh, uh, cancer, uh, re recurrence of their disease uh, and have again at that period of time a heightened risk for the development of thromboembolism. Now, what is striking, and these are rather old data, but they represent an important trend in the diagnosis of venous thromboembolism in, in hospitalized cancer patients. It's striking, these are United States data, but show over time an increase in the reported frequency of thromboembolic complications in uh, cancer patients in hospital. And the question one has to ask is, why is that? Is it because uh, we now uh, admit to hospital uh, older patients with malignant disease. Uh, uh, advancing age is an important risk factor in itself for the development of venous thromboembolism. Uh, is it because uh, we are now more aggressive in treating more advanced disease uh, in hospital, intervening uh, surgically, intervening uh, with more aggressive uh, chemotherapy, biological therapies, immunotherapy, which all heighten thrombosis risk? Is it that our imaging modalities uh, imaging both for cancer uh, and our ability to uh, image for patients with suspected sym symptoms of venous thromboembolism are more sensitive uh, and therefore we're diagnosing, for instance, with pulmonary embolism uh, more PE as incidental PE and we're going to hear later about the 
interesting question of how one should manage uh, inter incidental pulmonary embolism rather than sym symptomatic PE in cancer patients. But, but these type of data raise important questions because we're seeing an awful lot more disease thromboembolism in cancer patients and we need to try and understand what that is telling us and indeed if a lot of it is incidentally identified disease as a result of more advanced cancer imaging should we have different approaches to the management of that disease versus a symptomatic presentation and the answer will be given to us by a colleague very shortly so I'm not going to give you my own views on that matter. Now if one goes back historically uh, to data in the perioperative period in surgical patients undergoing uh, laparotomy uh, for abdominal or pelvic malignancy without thromboprophylaxis and looking at both the frequency of asymptomatic deep vein thrombosis screen detected using fibrinogen scanning or venography or, or indeed symptomatic disease one can see that without thromboprophylaxis in the era when that was considered uh, reasonable for patients undergoing laparotomy for major abdominal surgery, the reported frequency of thromboembolic complications in cancer patients was high. Calf vein thrombi, admittedly asymptomatic, of some 40 to 80 percent, but clinical rates of pulmonary embolism between 4 and 10 percent, and fatal PE rates where autopsy control uh, attended studies uh, looking at prophylaxis uh, of some 1 to 5 percent. This is a study that I think makes an important point about the residual challenge of trying to prevent thromboembolism in the perioperative period in uh, cancer surgical patients. In this trial, we randomized uh, some 21,000 patients to either low-dose unfractionated heparin given perioperatively, commenced prior to operation and continued um, uh, three times a day in the post-operative period, or to once daily low molecular weight heparin. And the primary endpoint in that study was to look at the frequency of venous thromboembolism and all cause uh, and death due to pulmonary embolism in patients who had undergone autopsy. And uh, there was no difference between the once daily low molecular weight heparin and the more frequently administered low dose unfractionated heparin. That was the primary study. So, this is the post uh, hoc secondary analysis. And in it, we asked the same study question about the frequency of thromboembolism, but this time, rather than dividing the populations by unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin, the, the, the uh, original randomization strategy, we looked at the outcome in all patients who received, were receiving perioperative prophylaxis by whether uh, they had an operation for malignant disease or an operation without cancer. And what one can see is despite the use of prophylaxis, the frequency of symptomatic venous thromboembolism and uh, autopsy proven uh, pulmonary embolism was higher in the cancer population despite prophylaxis than the non-cancer population undergoing operation and receiving the same forms of thromboprophylaxis. So this does indicate that the presence of malignant disease is an important determinant of surgical outcome. There is a higher overall mortality and a fourfold increase in mortality associated with uh, pulmonary embolism in the cancer surgical population. Now, if we look at uh, these data uh, generated in the United States, looking at the incidence of venous thromboembolism in a very large uh, national uh, data set, um, a, a particular outcomes program on surgical quality uh, conducted in the United States, one can see, and of course, bear in mind, we don't know uh, in this particular analysis what thromboprophylaxis these patients were receiving. But overall, if, you want, if one looks at, at surgical outcome, one can see an overall rate uh, by day 30 of 3.5% of symptomatic venous thromboembolism in the cancer surgical population. Uh, and you can see that that varies considerably depending upon the primary organ site uh, for operation. Uh, if one looks at uh, this into the post-discharge period, again up to day 30 in the large Aristos registry of some 2,900 patients in Italy, 
who were followed after discharge from hospital, having undergone operation for cancer, we see the same confirmation that the frequency uh, overall 2.1% for symptomatic VTE, but here I think all patients having received prophylaxis in hospital, what one uh, sees again is a variation in the frequency of uh, reported symptomatic thromboembolic complications by day 30 after operation, uh, varying by the original uh, primary uh, anatomical site of operation, bearing, these are, bearing in mind these are all uh, cancer patients. And if one looks again at the interesting question of the natural history of venous thromboembolism in the cancer surgical population, and in particular uh, tries to address the question of uh, is there a potential need for post-discharge prophylaxis in these populations, one can see here presentation of symptomatic venous thromboembolism and an intensity for presentation of VTE soon after operation in the period of time when patients are still in hospital, and then a resurgence of presentation of venous thromboembolism later after discharge, a very similar uh, pattern of presentation to that that we see in patients having undergone elective uh, hip arthroplasty. Now, if we turn away from the surgical oncology population to the medical oncology population, these are again old data, and, and of course uh, we have refined and we have colleague, medical oncology colleagues here who are uh, expert in these matters. But um, there have been major changes in the holistic care that is provided to patients receiving chemotherapy, uh, now principally on an outpatient basis with much greater attention uh, to the prevention and management of sepsis in these patients, uh, to careful hydration, to the careful use of uh, central lines and so on, which will have an impact on the reported frequency of thromboembolic complications. But if you go back to this interesting study and look at patients uh, with uh, breast mis malignancy receiving chemotherapy uh, and ask uh, the question, when do symptomatic thromboembolic events tend to occur in the medical oncology population, you can see that the majority of events in these studies occurred in the period of active chemotherapy. And once patients had completed chemotherapy, so presentation with thromboembolic uh, symptomatic events was less. And I think this is an important observation because as we start to try and understand when we should be protecting patients who either in the adjuvant or in the advanced disease setting are considered uh, at risk of thrombosis and therefore candidates for thromboprophylaxis, it appears to be in that period of time when patients are receiving chemotherapy that they should be protected, and that once those cycles of chemotherapy are over, so potentially the need to continue prophylaxis beyond that period uh, is somewhat questionable. And those are issues that uh, are being addressed in a number of prospective studies. So if uh, we look here now at data again from the United States in terms of organ site, and the frequency of reported thromboembolic complications in a medical oncology population, uh, you can see again an important variation. And we do recognize certain cancers to be more frequently associated with a risk for thromboembolism uh, and others uh, less so. Uh, and in this uh, study, you can see uh, one of the tumors that is uh, frequently considered to be a high risk for thrombosis pancreatic carcinoma uh, in a variety of other studies as well, uh, presenting uh, with a, a high frequency in this some 12% of patients developing a thromboembolic complication over the period of evaluation. Now, another uh, interesting question is the impact of stage on the uh, frequency of thromboembolic complications. And what one can see in this study is irrespective of the tumor type, Advanced stage disease is more frequently associated with thromboembolic complications than earlier stage disease. And that is, again, another important observation because our ability to be able to tailor in a more precise way 
effective thromboprophylaxis to risk populations of cancer patients needs to be informed by the very specific and unique therapies that we provide to them. And the unique way in which the risk of thromboembolism uh, is associated uh, with both factors, uh, with, with uh, patient-related factors, uh, such as their age, um, such as a previous history of venous thromboembolism, disease-associated factors, such as the histology of the cancer, the anatomical site of malignancy, and the stage of disease, and then treatment factors, uh, such as the, the interventions that we uh, provide both in terms of cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, and, interestingly, uh, biological therapies. So again, if one asks the question in terms of the reported frequency of thromboembolic complications, uh, one can see, again, from, by this study from Corona and colleagues uh, in the United States, that uh, uh, there seems to be a, a, a pretty, in the early cycles of chemotherapy, linear relationship between the reported frequency of thromboembolic complications uh, and uh, the cycles of chemotherapy. And you see here, in their particular study, they were able to determine a rate in a blended population, so a, a large unselected for other high-risk factors population, an overall frequency of a venous thromboembolism of about 0.8% per month, 0.7% per cycle. And that in itself, I think, again, is an important observation, but is an area that requires an awful lot more work. How should we apply uh, risk assessment to determining those cancer patients, uh, potentially in the adjuvant setting, who in large numbers are going to be receiving chemotherapy, but potentially also biological and other therapies, um, in terms of determining whether we add to the, the burden of their overall treatment with routine thromboprophylaxis. And uh, as you, uh, I will show you in a moment, there are risk scores there, are, there is the opportunity to incorporate the use of biomarkers to help us try and predict a high-risk population. But to date, uh, there has not been convincing uh, evidence that using those as the basis to, to, to select a population at high risk and therefore to intervene with thromboprophylaxis is proven. There is a study ongoing at the moment uh, that is looking at that uh, uh, question, the Cassini study, and I should declare an interest while I sit on the steering committee for that study. Uh, but it will be interesting to see, having identified for the first time, not on a population basis, by putting the question, uh, is this a high-risk individual because they've got advanced disease uh, and they're receiving palliative chemotherapy for their pancreatic cancer, let's randomise them uh, to a prophylaxis or no prophylaxis uh, study uh, during their chemotherapy, but rather use patient-specific factors uh, generated from this kind of understanding, are we able to reliably determine who should receive prophylaxis and therefore potentially uh, reduce the burden of disease? And that's an interesting question. The Save Onco study um, was a study, again, that I, I, I served on the steering committee of, where we randomised 3,400 uh, patients uh, receiving chemotherapy uh, to um, semuloparin, which was a new ultra-low ultra molecular weight heparin, or placebo. And what was striking is we designed the study on the basis of achieving a 60% reduction in the frequency of symptomatic events over uh, six months of uh, observation in patients receiving active chemotherapy. And we achieved exactly that. But what was striking was when these data were presented to uh, oncology colleagues, uh, you can see that the, the rate in the placebo group of 3.4% over that six-month period was considered an insufficient burden of disease to justify routine uh, chemotherapy in a uh, medical oncology population. And the data were similarly put to the FDA, and a similar view was taken by the advisory board that looked at these data. 
So it has raised the important question of whether there is a way of identifying patients at risk of venous thromboembolism in the outpatient chemotherapy setting. And Alok Karana has done a lot of work in this area, has generated a risk score, uh, derived it and then validated it uh, in, in a cohort of uh, patients who received a growth factor uh, for management of their disease and subsequently uh, he was able to use that very large cohort to uh, derive uh, this risk score. And he's able, uh, and others have confirmed this, to, to, to um, allocate patients to a low risk, uh, an intermediate or a high risk, and as the risk derived from these patient characteristics uh, increases, so the reported uh, frequency of venous thromboembolism increases. In um, Vienna, uh, the group of Parbinger and colleagues have refined that score by taking uh, the clinical elements of the Karana school and adding to them uh, D-dimer and P-selectin measurements. And when you do that, you can refine the score even further and identify a very high-risk population in terms of the frequency in that population of reported thromboembolic episodes. So, again, you can see that there is a methodology developing using risk scoring to identify patients at substantial risk for thromboembolic complications. And these are now, or certainly the Corona score, is being used in a large prospective study where patients with a high score are randomized to no prophylaxis or prophylaxis to determine if that is an appropriate way uh, to both identify patients and then intervene to minimize the burden of disease, in this case, venous thromboembolism. And the results of those studies uh, should be available in the next uh, year or so. Now, what about the burden of recurrent thromboembolism in the cancer patient who has had their first thrombosis? Well, this is a cohort that Prandonian colleagues uh, presented, yes, well, quite a long time, 15 years ago now, but I think a, a pivotal study because what he was able to do was to follow two cohorts of patients, uh, those uh, with cancer and those without cancer, uh, over a 12-month period of anticoagulation. And what he was able to demonstrate was that for patients receiving anti uh, anticoagulation, those with cancer were three times as likely, despite intervention, intervention with anticoagulation, uh, to develop a recurrent thromboembolism over the period of observation and twice as likely to have an a clinically important bleeding complication. And so this tells us that the cancer patient represents not, a, not only a challenge for venous thromboembolism in terms of primary thrombosis, but once they have a thrombosis, they are at substantially greater risk of a poor outcome from the management of their disease, a higher risk of recurrence and a higher risk of clinically important bleeding. If one uh, just, uh, this is, sorry, this is out of sequence. I just wanted to make the point about catheter-associated thrombosis in the era of, let us say, poor catheter management. Uh, and you can see that it's an important problem, but anticoagulation remains controversial. Let's get back to the flow of what I meant to say to you. If one then looks at uh, from the Rieti study, which is a huge registry across a number of European countries with now some 65,000 patients accumulated having presented with symptomatic DVT or PE and followed for the clinical outcome of that thrombosis. What we see is uh, when we look at uh, cancer patients uh, compared to no cancer patients, those with malignant disease being treated for their thrombosis have a higher frequency for fatal pulmonary embolism and a higher frequency of fatal bleeding, exactly mirroring, but here now looking in a large number of patients at fatal PE or fatal bleeding associated with management of a thromboembolic episode, you see again cancer patients do very badly. This does suggest an important emphasis on trying to prevent thrombosis 
where appropriate in these patients, because once they have it, the management is more complicated. And indeed, you see this in, a, in another large study looking at the um, rate of recurrent disease for uh, patients um, with and without cancer dependent upon INR control. And you can see that overall, cancer patients do worse than non-cancer patients when they're receiving a vitamin K antagonist. Are we able to predict those cancer patients with established thrombosis at greater risk of recurrent thrombosis? And this study proposes to do that and looks at um, a number of factors in a multivariate analysis that would predict for poor outcome, i.e. a high risk for recurrence. And if you look over time at the populations divided by either the presence or absence of uh, these uh, predictive risk factors, you can see that these factors do appear to help identify a population of patients with established thrombosis um, who uh, are at risk of recurrent venous thromboembolism. I'd like finally, if I may, in the last few minutes, to turn to the question of venous thromboembolism and uh, ultimate outcome. Uh, in cancer patients. And you can see here the very famous and often quoted New England Journal uh, of Medicine uh, paper by Sorensen and colleagues from Denmark, where they looked at uh, two populations of patients, uh, a population of patients who presented uh, um, with cancer and thrombosis at the same time, as opposed to a population who presented with cancer alone and followed them. And what was striking is that those cancer patients who presented at the same time with a symptomatic thromboembolic event, compared to those who presented with cancer alone, matched for all other cancer uh, predictive factors, had a lower survival rate. And that's an observation uh, that has been further made, uh, actually slightly earlier, by Levitan and colleagues in the United States, looking at the uh, probability of death within six months of initial hospitalization for two populations of patients at the time of hospitalization, patients who were hospitalized with the diagnosis of malignant disease alone, and those who were hospitalized with the combined diagnosis of a cancer and a thromboembolic episode, either DVT or PE. So looking at it in two ways, both at initial presentation or at initial hospitalization, the presence of a thrombosis with malignant disease in populations followed over time was associated with a poorer survival. Similarly, if we look at these data, uh, again, a United States study by Shen and Pollock looking at two populations of um, patients, uh, those um, uh, with pulmonary embolism in hospital, and this is in hospital mortality, but underlying uh, admission without cancer or underlying admission with poor management of malignant disease. What we see is that uh, there is a higher rate of mortality uh, associated um, uh, with the cancer diagnosis. Again, another piece of observational information that suggests the development of thrombosis in a cancer patient may be associated with a poorer clinical outcome. And what's striking, again, uh, from these uh, US uh, databases is when one looks at venous thromboembolism and inpatient mortality, the detrimental contribution to overall survival uh, attending the diagnosis of venous thromboembolism attends both those patients with earlier stage disease, in this analysis, without metastatic cancer, and those with metastatic cancer, more advanced disease. 
Again, that is, a, I think, a very striking uh, observation and does suggest uh, that we need to be sensitive to thromboembolic complications because it may be that their worst impact is on those where we have potentially the greatest hope of intervening with modern oncology management, surgical and medical, to achieve a good clinical outcome. And if one looks again, and this is the United States, at a very large sampling over a 10-year period, some 2 million, 2.5 million uh, major cancer operations, one can see here that the presence of venous thromboembolism in the cancer surgical population is attended by a much higher mortality. And uh, we see this uh, in, uh, I think, a study, this one from Memorial Sloan Kettering, a single institution, looking at a large number of patients who'd undergone a laparotomy or for abdominal or pelvic malignancy. There, there may have also been um, other operation sites in that study, but you can see overall uh, a 2% frequency of thromboembolic complications. And here is the um, five-year overall survival, and you can see that as you follow patients who's, who have undergone successful surgical intervention, those who have developed a post-operative thrombosis have a lower overall survival uh, than those who never developed a thromboembolic episode. Now, what is that telling us? Is it telling us that these patients who have had their first post-operative VTE are going to have a much greater risk for subsequent recurrent thromboembolism that may manifest as fatal PE? Is it telling us something about the underlying biology of the cancer, that more aggressive uh, cancers, histologically, biologically, are going to be associated with a greater risk for thromboembolism? And all this is telling us is that biologically those cancers are going to recur and are going to, uh, uh, therefore, have a detrimental impact on survival of patients. Nobody, nobody quite knows. Uh, another potential hypothesis that once you develop your first thrombosis, you activate blood coagulation, you generate a lot of coagulation proteases at the time of your intravascular thrombosis, and those will have an impact on the tumor. We know that tumors, both in stromal, in epithelial, and in endothelial elements, express protease receptors, and the interaction of these generated uh, proteases as a result uh, of intravascular coagulation activation and thrombosis uh, will have experimentally an impact on those tumors. But it's certainly a, an interesting observation uh, and does raise the question about the need to continue to emphasize appropriate thromboprophylaxis in the perioperative period, particularly extended into the post-discharge period to protect patients against their post-operative thrombosis. And, and one sees this both in terms of overall survival and disease-free survival. And again, if one looks at uh, outcome, you can see here in terms of um, the impact of venous thromboembolism across uh, different ana anatomical sites of operation, you can see higher mortality rates uh, for those patients who in the post-operative period developed uh, a venous thromboembolic complication. So Mr. Chairman, uh, in conclusion, I, I think we can say that venous thromboembolism is an important complication in the cancer patient population, both in terms of uh, the way that uh, thrombosis complicates the management of medical oncology patients, uh, those uh, complications and their impact in the perioperative and postoperative period, that once cancer patients develop a thrombosis, they're at greater risk for recurrent thrombosis and their management is complicated by a greater risk for potentially fatal bleeding complications, and that overall, we do have this observation that cancer patients who have developed a thrombosis have a poorer survival. The biological uh, characterization of that observation and what it should mean for clinical practice uh, is as yet uh, not fully explained. But what we understand today does suggest that appropriate risk assessment and selection of patients for primary prophylaxis is a vitally important feature of model, modern clinical practice uh, in oncology. Thank you very much indeed.